Okay, welcome to Covalent Molecules Part 2 of this Chemisode um, series of videos. This is for the VCE Unit 1 chemistry. However, it can also be used in a lot of other things as well. This is about naming covalent molecules. And remember, you also have the Chemisode um, app for iPad and iPhone. Check that out if you haven't already, and you can get these videos there. And you can also have about um, 250 to 300 flashcards in your back pocket and learn chemistry on the go. So let's have a look at this anyway, um, in terms of naming covalent molecules. Hopefully this goes up next. Here we go. Um, we have, this is what covalent molecules we learn about. We learn about drawing the valence structure. That was in part one, where we learned how to draw what covalent molecules look like. This is naming the molecule and their shapes. Um, and then we have a thing about polarity and that kind of goes with their, um, their structure. So then we have a summary of what happens as well. So I'll do that later on. Now let's look at naming the molecule and naming the shapes that they form. Here's a slide that explains how we name covalent compounds. The basic idea is the first element stays the same. So in a covalent compound, obviously you normally have two or more elements joined together. The first element stays the same. The second element, you change the end of it to an ide. That's very similar to what happens in ionic bonding. But there, the similarities end. The prefix, a prefix is what happens at the start of a word, denotes how many of something we have. So here is the prefix. If you have one atom, you call it a mono something. If you have two atoms, you call it a di something. If you have three atoms, you call it a tri something. If you have four atoms, you call it a tetra. Five, penta, he six, hexa. Let's see how we use that in a few examples. The idea here with mono, it only works for the second element. So if you have one of the first element in a compound, you don't um, use the mono prefix. Here's a first example, CO. The first element stays the same, so it's carbon something. The second element ends in ide, so it's going to be carbon oxide. The prefix denotes how many we have. We have one of this oxygen and one of the carbon. Having one of the carbon is the first element, we don't have to worry about it. The second element we put a mono in front of. So what it is, carbon monoxide because we have carbon as being the first element, stays the same, oxide because the second element ends in ide, and mono because we have one of the second element there. So it's carbon monoxide. Let's look at an example of how we can use di. We've got two nitrogens and one oxygen. The first element stays the same, but we've got two of them. So what it's going to be? It's going to be di nitrogen something. We have one of the second element, which is an oxygen, so it should be an oxide. So what is it? Two nitrogens, one oxygen, dinitrogen oxide, or dinitrogen monoxide it should be. Please, in your notes, write down dinitrogen monoxide. Not dinitrogen oxide, it should be dinitrogen monoxide, because we have one oxygen here. My apologies immensely at that. So it's dinitrogen monoxide. If we're using tri, here's an example, SO3. We have one of our first element, which stays the same, so it's sulfur. Then we have oxide. We have three of them, so it's trioxide. So it's sulfur trioxide. How do we use tetra? Same way. We have carbon tetrachloride. So this is an example of how we write the names of covalent molecules. The first element, we keep the same name. So carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, carbon. The second element always ends in ide. So we have oxide, 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 and chloride. And we use a prefix to denote how many we have. If it's just one at the start, we don't put mono, but if we have one at the end, we put monoxide. This, remember, so she said monoxide. If we have two, it's di, 
If we have three, it's tri. If we have four, it's tetra. Here's a few elements or a few compounds that I would like you to have a go of yourself. We have two nitrogens, three oxygens in this one. Please pause this podcast and write down what you think the name of these elements are going to be. So quickly press pause, write down what you think it's going to be, and then I'll show you your answers and see how you go. So pause this now. And we're back again. This first one, two nitrogens and three oxygens. So it's going to be dinitrogen trioxide. Dinitrogen trioxide. Next one I think is going to be this one, which you know is water, but if you want to name it in the correct way, the actual scientific um, and the IUPAC systematic name, it will be di sorry, dihydrogen monoxide. And that's just water. It's a fancy name for water, dihydrogen monoxide. Here we have silicon dioxide, and here we have phosphorus trihydride. Hopefully you got those right, and we can move on. If you didn't, have a look where you may have gone wrong, and we can move on. And if you still have a trouble, please bring it to me, either in class or bring it to your classroom teacher and say, why is this wrong? Why is this different to what Mr. Gowdy told, told me it was? All right, moving on, and let's look at the shapes that these compounds form. So, covalent shapes. What we have is the way that these molecules kind of form together, they form different shapes and we give them different names. The reason they come up with these different shapes is due to this thing called a VESPA. It's called valence shell electron pair repulsion. That's a large random name for something that says electron pairs want to be as far away as from each other as possible and that lone pairs take up more space than non-bonding pairs. Every molecule, or the ones that you deal with at the moment, are going to deal with a tetrahedral shape. Carbon, basically because we have eight electrons in the outside shell, and they come in pairs. So we have four pairs of electrons coming off a central um, element. These pairs of electrons want to be as far away from each other as possible. So what they're going to do is they're going to arrange themselves away so they can be as far away as possible. Let's take, for example, this methane element here, or this methane um, molecule here. We have carbon bonded to four hydrogens. What we see is these bonds want to be as far away as possible. That way, it comes up with this thing called a tetrahedral shape. If I draw a, um, a 3D version of this, this is what it will look like, where we have one bond sticking up, one bond going backwards, one bond coming towards us, another bond going out to the left. This is the most stable area that we can have because these pairs want to be as far away as possible from each other and this is how it obtains it, by getting this tetrahedral shape. If, for instance, we take off one of these hydrogens and we get a lone pair of electrons, like in this NH3, the VESPA model, the valence shell electron pair repulsion, tells me that the lone pairs take up more space than bonding pairs. So what happens is this lone pair of electrons pushes these hydrogens down a bit more. The lone pair pushes away the electron bonding pairs. What that means is instead of having a really nice shape like this, we end up with this kind of shape where we have the lone pair sticking up and our bonding pairs being pushed down, making a smaller um, angle between them. This is known as a triangular pyramid shape, okay? because it looks like a triangular pyramid. If you have one lone pair of electrons, you'll always get this shape where we have a triangular pyramid. If you have two lone pairs of electrons, like in the water molecule here, okay, oxygen in the middle, two hydrogens coming off, and two lone pairs. These lone pairs of electrons take up more space and they push these hydrogens closer together, these bonding pairs here. So what it ends up looking like is this, kind of a V or an upside down V. This is known as a V shape or a bent shape. 
If you have three lone pairs of electrons, what happens, these pair, lone pairs of electrons want to be as far away from each other as possible. They take up a lot of space and they just give you this straight molecule. The straight molecule is known as a linear shape. We have a tetrahedral shape, a triangular pyramid shape, a V or bent shape, and here we have a linear shape. This is all due to Vespa electron, sorry, the valence shell electron pair repulsion because electron pairs want to be away from each other as far as possible and that lone pairs take up more space and thus push these other bonding pairs away from each other. Let's have a look here. This is another slide that you have just outlining the idea of each shape where we have no lone pairs it's in this tetrahedral shape. One lone pair means that these hydrogen bonds here, these um, bonds between nitrogen and hydrogen, are pushed down. We get what's known as a triangular pyramid. The H2O is a bent shape because we have these two lone pairs of electrons. Three lone pairs of electrons, we get a linear shape happening. It just goes straight across. Another interesting one that comes up a lot is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, because we have these two double bonds, we end up with a linear shape as well. There's no, and the two lone pairs here, we just get a straight line happening here. It's just the easiest way that we can have these two bonds, these two double bonds, away as far as possible is to be at 180 degrees away from each other. So we get a linear shape with carbon dioxide. One lone pair, triangular pyramid, two lone pairs, V bent shape, three lone pairs, linear, no lone pairs, tetrahedral, and carbon dioxide is linear here as well. That's your molecule shapes. You just need to remember what they look like and how many lone pairs they are, they have. Moving on to a bit of um, you guys having a go of yourself. Here are a few molecules. What I'd like you to try and do is draw what these molecules will look like and then name the shape that they will have depending on how many lone pairs they have. So first things first, draw what these molecules will look like and then name the shape that they have. Pause this podcast and do this now. Okay, now you're back. Let's have a look at what these molecules look like and what shape they are. First of all, we have dihydrogen sulfide and we have two lone pairs, so this means it's a V bent shape. The second one is carbon tetrachloride. It is simply no lone pairs, so therefore it's a tetrahedral shape. Phosphorus trihydride is um, one lone pair up here and three bonds, bonding pairs, so therefore it is a triangular pyramid, and chlorine, just by itself, Cl2, chlorine is three lone pairs each side, which means we have a linear shape, it means it's going to be a straight line. Remember, these lone pairs wouldn't normally be drawn like this as um, valence structures, they would be looking like this. So V, bent shape, triangular pyramid, linear, and tetrahedral, all because of the way they look. Moving on to a bit of a summary. Key points. Covalent molecules are three-dimensional. The VESPA, the valence shell electron pair repulsion, is the um, idea of why they get their molecular shapes. Lone pairs of electrons push bonding pairs close together, and these are our um, four shapes that we really deal with, tetrahedral, triangular pyramid, V-shaped, and linear. That is a summary of the key points. We also should have a summary in here of the naming, but I think that's pretty straightforward for naming covalent molecules. But really, that is all um, this podcast is about. So it's all about naming covalent molecules and finding out their shapes that they uh, make. Next time, we're going to look at polarity and look at a bit more of the properties of covalent molecules and how they can be explained using this idea of polarity in covalent molecules. But until then, 
happy studying and enjoy your chemistry. Cheers.